Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, big changes could be coming to the Whois database in the name of privacy, but security experts have major concerns. Then we've got our suggestions for rolling your own server, a big batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 129 of Jupiter Broadcasting's Weekly Systems Network and Administration Podcast. We stream this episode live on September 19th, 2013. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, GoDaddy.com and Ting.com. I'll tell you more about those sponsors as the show goes on. And our live stream is powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. you got to go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher. Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris. Everybody, thanks for watching. Well, hello, Mr. Jude. One away from 130. Does it feel big? Does that feel like a monumental number to you? No, no, particularly. no. no. Uh, okay, so let's play my favorite game. Whenever we're doing a time travel episode, where yes. is Alan the Thursday at 1 p.m. that we'd normally be recording this? Where in uh, the world would Alan be right now? Probably at dinner, but uh, the Dev Summit at uh, EuroBSTCon Malta. Uh, are you, be honest with me, are you looking forward to eating? Like, is that, because when I travel, that's, I mean, obviously I got, I mean, I, my belly tells all, but I, when I travel, like, the thing that I look forward to is the eating aspect of it. And I like the group eating, I, you know, all of it. Is that? Well, yes, I, I, I look forward to enjoying dinner with a bunch of really cool people from FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, and so on. But the actual eating part, not so much. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the food's going to be like in Malta. <laughs> Like, That's true. I guess in Japan, don't. it was interesting. Yeah. Although, the whole time, I, the only sushi I had was at lunch in the bento boxes. Yeah, you made we didn't it pretty actually fun. go out for sushi. Oh. <laughs> we had, you know, box. the regular Japanese food. Because even in Japan, you know, you don't eat sushi every day. So, um, we're, could, are, do you know, are they live streaming any of this stuff? Like, could people be watching this right now? Yeah. As far as I know, they will not be watching. Oh, right. But it will be recorded and posted on YouTube after that. And you might even be walking away with a couple of interviews if everything works yes. out. Yes. Uh, we're very much going to try to corner certain people and not let them have dinner until they give us an interview. Say, no, you must be on our BSD Now podcast. It is amazing! Yes. Uh, or, you know, uh, Chris's idea was to, to talk to the uh, organizers of the event and try to get some extra drink tickets to bribe people with. You know what? That's a great idea. That works. That well, works. I don't drink, so I'll have some spare ones to oh, begin yeah. with. So. Oh, yeah. Although, you know, you could break your no-drinking rule because uh, it's not breaking your rule if you're not it's in the not country. A, it's, it's not a rule as much as I just don't like alcohol. <laughs> well, I understand. I, I mean, I don't understand, but I understand. Right. All right, Alan. Well, uh, the <coughs> first story we have this week, a bit of a controversy a brewing about the who is data and who should well, have access this, to it. This is, we've talked about it before, but yeah. it seems like the, uh, ICANN is just ignoring everybody and doing it anyway. <laughs> So what's going on? Uh, so the internet regulators, ICANN, the guys that give out registration agreements for like .com and .net and .org and all the other TLDs, even the country-specific ones, right? they control the root DNS and they decide what the new TLDs are going to be and so on. Uh, so they're pushing this controversial plan to restrict uh, the public who is database. So right now you can run a who is on any domain and see who owns it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they're pushing for this system called the Aggregated Registration Directory Service, or ARDS, uh, that would basically get all that the domain registration information together. Uh, it would obviate the private registration stuff, so you wouldn't be able to do private registration anymore. Uh, your real details would go in this ARDS, uh, but they would restrict access to who can query the ARDS. Oh, so like you wouldn't just be able to have like a good old who is command and look stuff up. Right. So basically only people that are specifically authorized uh, would be allowed to look things up in this database. Uh, and they would ratchet up the, the requirement that the data be accurate. Okay. Oh, that's what this is about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, see, according to an interim report by ICANN Working Group, the who is data would be accessible only to, quote, Authenticated requesters that are held accountable for appropriate use. Uh, so, you know, it seems like they're trying to phrase this as if they're just trying to block the spammers who, you know, crawl the Whois database and uh, spam people. But it sounds more like they're trying to 
you know, tie more stuff to people's real identities. Right. They want, they want to be able to say, well, now that we're requiring more real identities, now that we're not allowing private registration, you can trust us because we have this new sophisticated system to prevent abuse. Well, it's more that we're only going to let certain people have access, and so we'll know who is abusing it. Uh-huh. And we'll deal with it that way or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, so, yeah, the, the working group's current plan envisions creating what's called the Aggregated Registration Directory Service, serve as a clearinghouse uh, that contains all of the, uh, or contains a non-authoritative copy of all the collected data elements for everything. The registrars uh, and registries would still operate their, you know, like VeriSign does .com or, you know, the dot .name and .biz, etc., uh, would be responsible for maintaining the authoritative copies of the WHOIS database, but they wouldn't be publicly accessible. Uh, those who wish to query the WHOIS domain registration data from the system would have to apply for access credentials to the ARDS, which would be responsible for handling data accurately uh, or dealing with complaints that data is incorrect, uh, auditing access to the system to minimize abuse, managing the licenses agreements to access the WHOIS data, etc. Oh, oh, wow. Licensing agreements, accessing? Uh, this is getting, this is getting like yeah. a whole layer of bureaucracy around this. Exactly. Uh, so the interim pro uh, proposal was met with a swell of opposition from security and technology experts who worry that the plan's potential harm to consumers and, and cybercrime investigators, right? People that are working in anti-malware use who is records to tie different domains together and to I see use it. You know, where I, things are hosted. I, mean, I, 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 I use it just for, there's a lot of reasons. You, I, maybe I want to yep. know where something's located. Maybe I want to find out what something, I mean, somebody's in our damn IRC room. Sometimes I'll use it to do a lookup. I mean, like. Yeah, or even just, you know, when does this domain expire? Yeah, I want it. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, it's one of mine. I want to double check. Or, you know, what are the name servers? Where is this hosted? What's so, going on here? What the hell, Alan? Yeah. Uh, so a quote from uh, an open letter sent by a bunch of uh, security researchers and other sites says, Internet users, including individuals, businesses, law enforcement, governments, journalists, and others, should not be subject to barriers, including requiring prior authorization, uh, disclosure obligations, meaning, you know, if you read this data, you can't tell anybody what you saw. Oh, uh, interesting. Or artificial barriers, like having to pay to get access. Uh, in order to gain access to information about who operates a website with the exception of legitimate privacy protection services. Right? So, yeah, a journalist is trying to look up some information on uh, to who owns a website. And now they have to pay a fee to ICANN to be able to look this up. This or, you know, security me, research, it seems like a really bad idea. This seems like the opposite of kind of what, I mean, the net is open by default, Locked down and closed where necessary. This is a closed, locked up by default system. It's like the sort of it's like an important part of the web that is completely reversed to the overall nature of the internet. Yep. That's pretty wonky. I don't know what to make of it other than I mean, so I guess if you're gonna come to me and you're gonna say, All right, Mr. Fisher, well we need to have this information about you, this, 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 that way we can verify it's you. We need a little DNA sample, maybe uh, if you could put a stool sample in this cup for us so that way we have it on file. Uh, maybe, like, depending on how much they got on me, then I'd want it behind closed doors. You know, uh, until it's just not much more than you can look up in the phone book by look up by, or find by looking up my business name. I mean, that's that's that to me is the real. Like, it, as long as the as long as the who is information is really what's in the, you know, whatever's out there in the directory because you're a business or whatever, it doesn't seem like it's worth all this effort and yeah. all this extra bureaucracy. Well, and, you know, Curb specifically says that the working group's interim report leaves open the question of how exactly the ARDS is going to be more accurate than the current one. People are just as likely to lie. Right. I guess because you're going to have paid uh, monkeys that are going to be looking up on? I, I don't well, know. Well, yeah, like, the privacy thing is, raises some questions. Like, I understand uh, the balance between people not wanting their, you know, billing address listed for anybody to look up, but at the same time, you know, I think who is privacy was kind of a bad thing. Is this, I, I wonder now, this is just getting crazy, but I wonder if this is being pushed a little bit by the, uh, by the copyright lobby, because maybe this, Probably. Is, maybe this is a way to crack down on pirates, right? Because you can find out who they are, they can't throw up a torrent tracker and do it without yep. getting fined, and um, I don't know. Well, it's something we'll probably just keep an eye on as it develops, I suppose. Good to see that guys like Curbs and a few others are, are at least raising the red flags around this. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the show notes, we have linked to the initial report from the 
quote-unquote expert working group, and uh, you can read their uh, PDF if you'd like, and uh, kind of explains their, 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 theory, their theory. And kind of what their goal is, too, domain name control, regulatory, contract enforcement, domain name purchase and sale, oversight, abuse mitigation, and Internet services provision, whatever the hell that means. Pretty, could be pretty intense. Yep. So a link to that is in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. Okay, Alan. Well, let's hit the pause button right here so I can thank uh, something that's also quite intense, and that is our fantastic sponsor, Ting.com. Go to techsnap.ting.com so you can just lock in that savings right now because everything I'm about to tell you about Ting is going to blow your mind, my friends. It's going to blow your mind. So not only is Ting my personal mobile service provider and some great Canadians, but they provide mobile service with no contracts, no early termination fees, no bundling or ride-along services, and no add-on charges for things like voicemail, caller ID, tethering, hotspot, three-way calling, call forwarding, and other features that are just part of the Ting service with no charge. And I got to tell you, when you combine these nice smartphones with a fantastic service like this, and the, the prices are incredible because you only pay for what you use, it's really awesome. But what's great and exciting is Ting just lit up a whole bunch more LTE service. Now, this is one of those things where it's like, I bought my HTC One, and it is an LTE-capable phone. But in my neck of the woods, didn't have LTE service. And I just kind of resigned myself to the fact that I wasn't going to have LTE. And the one magical day i went outside and i had lte service and that's because it has just been fired up in a bunch of more locations now at a total of 185 markets that support lte on ting 100 and 185 markets is dang a bunch of them in fact yep. they just recently added uh, just in mid september added a whole bunch more and a bunch of them are in texas so they're just rolling these out as fast as possible with the goal of 200 million people served by lte at the end of 2013 i have to say that's quite an impressive goal and lte is amazing it is magic sauce in wireless when you combine that with the easy to use ting dashboard the pay for what you need aspect with the easy to use family pool if you need that or just one line or if you're a small business you got multiple people on there. They make it super easy to manage the accounts with apps on the device or the easy-to-use admin control panel. And, of course, they have a no-hold customer support, as well as a great selections of used and new phones, including a personal concierge service who will go find you a used phone. I really got to say, when you do the math, and you can do literally the math when you go to techsnap.ting.com and click on that How Much Would You Save button, they put it right there in the middle because this is really going to impress you. And when you factor in how much you'll save every single month, combined with Ting's early termination relief program, where they'll take 75 bucks off of that early termination for each of your phones, folks, you've got to go check it out. So go to techsnap.ting.com, see what I've been telling you about. This is mobile that makes sense. Average Ting bill, $21 a month. That is not bad. Annual savings for a Ting customer, $182. $182, and that's on a family plan with multiple devices. One of the great things about Ting is if you don't use that device, you just pay for the line. It's like 6 bucks, and you pay for what you use. So if you get one of their overdrive pros, so you want to have a Wi-Fi hotspot when you travel, because maybe you're like Alan, and you're going to all these big-time Big Shot conferences talking about the BSDs. Alan could take this. He could have it there at the conference with him. He only uses it when he needs it. And if he's not going to a conference that month, it just sits in the drawer and he just pays the six bucks. He's not paying for this big old data plan every single month that he might not be using. So gadget guilt is gone thanks to Ting. And that is worth it right there. So go to techsnap.ting.com. Take $25 off your first month of service or $25 off your first or $25 off a device. So one of the things about Ting that is really kind of nice, and I did, this is actually how I got into Ting originally. I brought my Evo. So I walked in with my Evo, and I said, all right, this is a Sprint phone. I don't know if I'm ready to make the commitment yet. I'll try the Evo out. Ported it over, super easy, did it all through their web, face, web interface, never had any kind of problems. And then later on when I decided, you know what? I want to get myself a brand new device. I got it off contract. Didn't have to get myself into some two-year scam and I'm really quite happy. So go to techsnap.ting.com. Go check them out. Thanks to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Still working on that Canadian Ting service for you, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem is there's no provider in Canada that's... Uh, Does the MVNO thing. Or we will do any kind of reselling at all. They're yeah. evil. You guys, well, maybe eventually they'll see how we're doing it down here and they'll, they'll shake it up for you. So we've talked about WeChat on this show about three months ago. It's come up from time to time in our IRC. Uh, looks like after a little of, of an audit, folks are considering security lax. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, so the, specifically, the WeChat Android client 
has an undocumented debugging interface, uh, which allows anybody with access to the phone or any other app on the phone uh, to be able to see what's going on in your WeChat. Uh oh. And get like everything. Uh, so the interface allows an attacker to intercept all data flowing through the WeChat application, including your username and your hash password, as well as your unique ID that uh, some other security features in WeChat are based off. Okay. Uh, the hash password is literally just a straight MD5. There's no salt. It's not MD5 crypt even. It's just an MD5 of your password. It's horribly weak, and nobody should be doing that. Nobody should have been doing that five years ago, let alone now. Yeah. Um, this is one of the things I've noticed, Alan. So that makes it uh, possible to brute force a rainbow table to password really easily. So when you're in the Google Play Store, I've been looking for like secure chat programs that are off the record and private and all that, and they'll just say world-class encryption or trust no one safety, like not even using the right terminology. And you have no idea what the implementation is behind it, and WeChat was one of them. They were guilty of that. Ah! I don't like it because there's no real tool set for the consumer to use in these app stores to gauge if something's actually reliable or not. We've got to wait on these kind of audits. Yep. I like that they did a little Wirecast packet sniffing, or Wirecast, Wireshark uh, packet okay. sniffing too. Yeah, so uh, they have a quote here. In WeChat versions up to 4.3.5, they identified several vulnerabilities uh, with which they allow an attacker who can intercept traffic to quickly decrypt the message. Uh, thus being able to access all the messages sent and received by the user. Uh, more recent ver versions seem to be immune to this attack, but they're still working on it to see if, you know, they can trivially overcome the, uh, the improvements that were made. Ah. Uh, because it's, it switched, uh, some version, uh, WeChat switched from doing regular HTTP to doing this custom protocol. And it, it does like, the first packet is with RSA and then it goes to AES, and uh, it seems that you can somehow get the key and decrypt it all. So they're actually catching it in the wire, uh, over the wire. They're not over the wireless, I suppose. They're not, it's not like... Well, basically, they found both vulnerabilities. There's oh. a debugging interface where they can, uh, on the phone, see the plain text before it's sent. Uh, and then there's the way that they send it over the internet, uh, where someone could catch it. It's, you know, if you're using the Wi-Fi at a Starbucks, somebody could be getting it. Right. Uh, also, the local SQLite database that stores all the information for WeChat is encrypted. But the key is fairly trivially derived from just your WeChat UID and the device ID of the device you have it installed on. And that UID can be captured along with your username and password from the debugging interface. So since you know, you know the algorithm, you can get the key to decrypt that database if you have all the data you can get from the debugging interface. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, the researchers tried to contact the developers to notify them of the problems but they had no luck. They wrote an extra email to the uh, technical support for the parent company uh, on August 30th and September 3rd, and they still didn't get a reply. Uh, not a good sign. And so sign. they published their findings. Not a good sign. That's the kind of thing where this type of, type of program, the developers need to have kind of a commitment to being a little extra responsive. Um, all right, any other thoughts on that one? Just nope. kind of a warning to folks? All right, well, before we do our next spot, why don't we cover our next story, because this is one that we've been watching a little bit. I think you mentioned it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the DRAM price issue where there was, like, flooding, right? It was causing yes. the prices to go up. All right, so I'm sure everything's better now, right? Prices are going back down, RAM's super cheap. Problem solved. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, the RAM prices are st uh, were driven up almost 30%, 27% uh, in total, and uh, aren't expected to go back down very soon. Man, you called it. Hopefully people got their RAM orders in before it hit everywhere. I don't know. Did you? Uh, so, no. As TechSnap reported previously, there uh, was a chemical explosion and fire at the H, uh, SK Hynix plant in Wuxi, China on September 4th. Uh, the company is attempting to rush repairs to the damaged fabrication facility and has reopened the remaining fab at that site on September 7th. Okay. Uh, so the site is actually two separate fabs kind of co-located with each other. And they're specifically designed, so if there's something that happens at one, it doesn't break the other one. But you remember after the fire, they immediately closed the whole plant. Yeah. Uh, but three days later, they had the other, they undamaged half of the plant back up and running. Uh, they've also started shifting some of their production to their other plants in Korea. Uh, but the shortage drove the price up 27% anyway, even though nobody's actually run into a shortage yet. It's just anticipated. Right. Uh, the plant in China makes approximately 10% of all of the world's supply of DRAM. Uh, 
And, you know, so that's missing 10% per day, right? So it adds up quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Hynix expects the plant uh, in China to be back at full capacity uh, or, you know, the capacity it was running at when the fire happened uh, sometime during October. Okay. They're hoping anyway. So soon-ish. Uh, uh, full repairs will take between three months and six months uh, and in total will reduce the total output of the plant by two months worth of production. So, you know, that 10% adds up to everything they would have made for two whole months. Yeah. Uh, you, know what, you know what it's all about? It's all about mm -hmm. smartphones and Windows 8.1. That's where all the memory is going. Well, the, the, and you're skipping ahead. <laughs> oh, is that legitimate? Uh, oh, I was just yeah. kidding. <laughs> uh, even even once, the repairs of, uh, the, once the repair plan is online, uh, HK Hynix plans to keep the RAM production levels uh, amped up beyond what they were previously and keep the amping up in Korea, right? So they turn Korea up to try to make up some of the shortfall. Yeah. And they're rushing to get the plant back online and they're going to run it at more than 100% as well because uh, they're ramping up production in stages and trying to get as much production on, online as possible to match the spike in demand for PC-oriented chips that's expected to start October 18th when Windows 8.1 ships. Oh, okay, so that is legitimate. Yeah. Nobody buys Windows 8.1 though. Right. Most people would be an upgrade, right? Not a not a new machine. Although, the, if you were going to buy a new machine right now, you might wait a couple of weeks for eight one. Yeah, you probably would, wouldn't you? It's like, I want a start menu. <laughs> well, it's just a start button. I think they're calling well, yeah, it, they're, all the, they're calling it the start flag now. I think is that legit? Like, that's, is that did that actually get picked up as the start flag? I don't, I don't know. What, so it all it does is launch something, not not the old start menu. Right. It yeah. just brings you to the full screen. Windows Metro interface. The same thing the Windows key does. Right. Well, it will unbreak my brain a little bit just because I'm used to the start menu being there, and now it's my Firefox icon that's there because it's pinned, mm -hmm. and I keep starting Firefox when yeah. I want the start menu. That is literally the scenario they're solving. <laughs> that is it. That is all the But person. I want the actual start menu <laughs> back. I it's, know. Like when you press the, the Windows key, if you start typing... Like you would in your like your Windows Seven, you start typing in it would do a search. That still works. So the whole menu is there, it's just yeah. buried under the Metro thing, and it's like just bring it back. So here is you know you know me. I'm not Mr. Windows. I'm not like the biggest Windows proponent, but I would argue that the Windows Seven start menu was as close to launcher perfection as any operating system has ever seen. I believe it was faster and 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 more functional than anything I've seen on Linux or you know. BSD, like, you know, like the KDE menu. It's way better than what they're doing in 8. It's way better than what OS X's got. OS X doesn't even have an application launcher menu. They've just got the dock. I mean, it was like the perfect sweet spot. It had search capabilities. You could get to all of your configuration management. You could launch all of your applications. You could pin your favorites in there. It was, it was fast. It was stable. It was quite literally, I believe, one of the best implementations of application launchers ever. And they just threw it out. Just got rid of it. And now, they, now you got a flag. Yeah. You got a start flag, Alan. Horrible. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. You know what it makes me want to do? Kick him in the face. Yep. And that's why I recommend GoDaddy.com. That's right. GoDaddy.com is the TechSnap sponsor. And they have incredible deals. If you use the code TECH199 when you're checking out over at GoDaddy, you will get a .com for $1.99. Now, additional domains, or if you want additional years, $9.99. Folks, that's still a great deal. $9.99? Are you kidding? That's a great deal. I mean, you go over there, you'll know you're there because Jean-Claude's kicking you in the face, just like I want to do to Microsoft right now. And he's going to kick everything up a notch. They're working on a lot of business packages. They're working on collaboration processes, yep. things for groups. In fact, I mean, Alan and I mention it all the time. But it was like uh, two weeks ago, I was like, um, hey, Rikai, let's do something to our Jupiter Colony page, right? So then Rikai comes up with this brand new JupiterColony.com page. Looks great. Uh, but then I got really busy doing shows and stuff. I wasn't able to update our DNS. So Ange contacted Alan for me and was like, hey, Alan, I know you have rights to our Jupiter Colony stuff. Can you log into your GoDaddy account and set this up for us? He didn't have and to have my And she's still explaining user. what she wants and it was already done. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. And what's funny is, like, normally in order to do that, I'd have to give you my GoDaddy login and my password and you'd have to go into yep. my account. No, no. Now, with the group collaboration stuff, GoDaddy makes it super easy. It makes it the way it should work. I put it in a certain exactly. folder. Exactly. It's not secure to share a username and password. No. That's why you have delegation. The whole point is this way, from your account, you can see this change wasn't made by Chris. It was made by Alan. And it's great. You know, GoDaddy is the world's number one domain name registrar, so they have to do everything at scale. they got to think 
how do groups need to work together, how do individuals need to work, and how do small businesses need to work. And when you combine that with the fantastic deals and the fact that they're longtime supporters of the TechSnap program, well, that's one hell of an offering, isn't it? So go to our show notes and click on our special banner, and it'll pre-charge your shopping session with a $1.99 shopping code. Or when you're over there and you're about to check out, just click the uh, promo code bo button and put in Tech199, and you'll get a dot .com for $1.99. Thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Such a great deal. Such a great deal. And I also am kind of a big Jean-Claude fan. I haven't even told my dad yet. My dad is a huge <laughs> Jean-Claude fan. <laughs> whenever, whenever, I, we, whenever, when I was a kid, whenever a Jean-Claude movie came out, we had to go see it. It was great. Um, I hear the uh, magical Cherry MX keyboard, Alan, so that must mean uh, only one thing. That brings us to the end of the news segment. <laughs> and then it's time, right? Am I right? Yep. All right, yep. good. I want to make sure. Well I thought so. I thought I could tell by the tone of the Cherry MX, but I wasn't positive. So that means it's time for the Tech Snap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or pop in that contact link at the top of our website or even better. Starting the thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv like our first submission did this week. Alan, are you ready for it? Yep. All right, it comes in from Tess5884, or 5884, whatever that is. Hi, guys. I'd like to draw on everyone's collective knowledge, and specifically Chris as a contractor. I have a client who I do hourly sysadmin work for at the rate of $115 per hour. They want me to start proactively monitoring their servers, etc. Any suggestions on how I'm supposed to charge for that? I'm assuming the monitor would be getting Nagios and Zabbix emails alerts directly to me, as well as having the monitor graphs alert my office, things like that. Thanks for any input. Alan, what do you think? Uh, for something like that, we oftentimes do like a retainer, where they pay a rate for like five hours a month, and if they don't use it all, then it doesn't all get used, but they have to pay for it anyway. And if there's some extraordinary event that means that they, I need to spend more than five hours looking at it, then... They pay the extra hourly rate on top of it. Yeah, that's that would probably be the one little caveat is you know leave yourself some buffer so that way if you see something you give yourself enough of a profit. Margin. Right, like this is this is proactive monitoring, right? So it means finding out there's a problem, fixing the problem, get billed at the hourly rate. Right, and you don't want to end up having to fix it and only charge for just the monitoring. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you could kind yeah. of get screwed if you're not careful. Um, right. So, so yeah, if you do something like a. a Retainer of say, so you just you say it's normally, you're like you're normally 115, so give a slight break. It's 500 dollars, and you get up to five hours of, of monitoring or whatever. Yeah. Or, you know, you set like an on-call rate or something. You know, you pay this much flat a month, and you get a discount, right? So, say you set it up, they pay an extra 200 dollars a month for the proactive monitoring, and if when something comes up, you only charge them 95 dollars an hour instead of 115. And that way, you're getting more of that monthly income, and they're getting the peace of mind, and then they get a break on the, the hourly price if the monitoring finds something that you have to come in and fix. Yeah, then it's a, yeah I think that's a good way to do it. And, and, yeah. you know, or, and, or, you know, maybe an exemption from your after-hours rate, if, depending on how you do it. The thing yeah. I like about that, too, is if you're kind of basing it on that, it's not one fixed set, so that way if you have a client that comes along that maybe has a network that's twice the size, you can adjust that. It's more of an hourly-based thing, so you can say, well monitor something this size can take a little more time so you can charge them a little more i think that's a good way to go okay all right so good work at t to the z and uh let us know how it goes all right email comes in from avid i think maybe avid he says hi chris and alan avid here you know if you think i'm gonna butcher it sometimes it'd be easier just to put the uh the irc handle in there all right here we go he says i'm a viewer since episode one and i love the show you asked for questions so here comes one that's been nagging me recently Alan and I have started using Puppet almost at the same time. However, mm -hmm. my use is more sparse and dispersed. I'd like to know how, from someone who has been actively using it in production, what his thoughts are about orchestration. I mean, Puppet is great, a great tool for configuration management, and you set it once in Puppet, walk away, and for up to 30 minutes, and all of the machines have the config. But mm -hmm. what if the new configuration requires staging? I mean, if one would like to use Puppet to push a configuration change, but would like it to also, say do some pre-maintenance work, like notify Nagios that something is about to happen, maybe set up some intermediary stage for the duration of the change, see, perform, perform the change at a set time, you know, within, instead of, like, instead of just in the next 30 minutes, but specifically at this time. Yep. 
assuming the change was successful, do do like some sort of post maintenance work, like reactivate the Nagios checks. He's wondering if you've solved any of those above problems and how you did them. There's a couple things. Uh, Puppet supports different environments, so you can have like dev and staging and production, uh, so that you can have you know, try it out on a certain subset of servers first or, you know, a, a mini network of virtual machines at the office and make sure it all works before you push it out to the live network. Um, you don't have to wait that 30 minutes. You can, if you use something like, uh, it's called M Collective, you can push out the command to make all the servers update at once or, you know, you can say make a five minute window and have everybody get all the new configs much quicker instead of having to wait for that 30 minutes. And if you do that, you can maybe change that 30 minute window to be longer, right? Have each machine only pull once every two hours. And if then there's something that needs to be done more quickly than the two hours, you can push out a command that makes them all check in sooner. Uh, for pre-maintenance and post-maintenance, you can do stuff like that in Puppet. You know, you say, once this file exists, you can do this check or whatever. Because, uh, okay, okay. yeah, like if you're, if you're using Puppet to push code or whatever, you push out a new version, you also need it to, you know, uh, apply this SQL change to refactor this table, right? Add the new column that this code uses. Um, but at that, that case, you want it done at the same time as part of the update, not after, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for pre and post maintenance, depends how you set it up. Uh, I, I didn't use the built-in Nagio stuff. I kind of wrote my own for Puppet. So it just writes uh, one config for each box into a directory on the, on the Nagio server. And so disabling and enabling, it depends how you do it. Uh, for me, generally, I kind of do it manually. But uh, you should be able to, to push that change fairly easily. Uh, just by a change to the template, you can say that this server is now in this class that has monitoring turned off and then change it back after. Very good. I might help. Because uh, you, you might not want to disable monitoring for all of Nagios, just for the set of servers right. that, yeah, that are going to... Yeah, I would think so. Down. I would think that's, yeah. Although I imagine you could also... And I've never done it, but there's like an API for Nagios where you can schedule downtime and say, hey, we expect this machine to be down from here to here. Right. And it affects the reporting. It, that doesn't get reported as unplanned downtime. It's reported as planned downtime. And it doesn't set off alerts. Or, or you can optionally have it do it either way and so on. Pretty good. Hopefully that'll help him get started. Now, our next question comes from Jason, and he decided to get real fancy and send us a video version of it. In fact, it's not even so much a question. Jason's noticed sort of a trend with our audience in terms of rolling their own mail server and uh, uh, Samba servers and things like that, so he sent in a few bits. Hi Chris and Alan. This is just a quick video. I thought I'd respond to your request for um, feedback and information for your upcoming episodes. Over the past few weeks, I've noticed a few of your viewers have been asking very similar questions to yourselves, like how to roll your own mail server, how to set up a Samba server, and directory servers, and so forth. Even you, Chris, you keep threatening to roll your own mail server. Well, I found a product in Germany at a CBIT show which would do all of those things. It's, um, the product's really quite good, actually. I mean, it's, it's so good, I've decided become a reseller myself. Well, I'm actually a distributor of the product. Um, the product's called IP Brick. Pause for laughter. <laughs> that's an overly yes, long that's line. right. I said the product's called IP Brick. But it makes kind of sense. The appliances look like gold bricks and it runs on TCP IP. Besides, it's kind of hard these days. Apparently, it was quite difficult to find domains were free for the names they wanted to call it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, with that aside, let's have a look to see what it does. Let me briefly explain what it is. If you can picture yourself installing your most favorite distro, and on that you install OpenVPN, OpenSwan for IPsec, uh, OpenLDAP, Courier Mail, XM for SMTP, Asterix, ISC Bind, ISC DHCP, Squid Proxy, and all these other cool stuff. Okay? Now, you know what it's like even just installing LDAP from the command line. It's quite tedious. Now, imagine you've got all these components, all these services that you now want to integrate. 
if you just change the DNS name, for instance, you've got to go in and regenerate all the SSL certificates, you've got to change bind rules, you've got to change DNS zones, da da da. Well, IP Brick is actually a management tool that sits on top of all those services and then takes away all that headache for you. It's a commercial product, that aspect is commercial. So that's what IP Brick is. It's just basically the management tools. It comes, you can either run it as uh, a software, a software uh, virtual machine, or deploy it directly on your servers, or you can purchase ready made and ready built IP Brick appliances. Okay? That's pretty cool. Yeah, anyway, I hope that's um, useful. And um, if anyone asks how to quickly and easily create these types of services, at least there's a bit more information you can um, you can give your your viewers. Oh, well, thank you, Jason. That looks interesting. And he, uh, Alan, I don't think you got to see it. He had actually like a little uh, appliance device that uh, so you can buy yep. these and just slide it into the rack, which is really cool too. Thanks. I'm still trying to decide if I want to soak this or to get like a super micro atom box. Yeah, I know, right? Did you get the atom one? The super micro atom? Um, mine is a Core i3, I think. Uh, ah, yeah. well, I guess, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Doesn't have to be an atom. No. Uh, all right, so not that guy wrote in. He said, uh, will Mozilla Persona fail just as open ID? Hey, Chris and Alan, I sent this question a few weeks ago, but you missed it. So I hope it's okay that I ask again. I don't know if we actually, I thought we did answer this, but here I we think go. We, okay. Well, no, do you think we did too? I don't think we answered it, but I, I think I recall seeing it, but we get so oh. much email. Uh, in TechSnap 120, at the 23-minute mark, you talked about open ID and how unfortunately it never really has taken off. In 2001, Mozilla launched Persona, formerly known as Browser ID, and a privacy-aware single sign-on system that uses an email address as a prov and a provider to authenticate the user. It already works automatically with all Yahoo and Gmail addresses, and if everything turns out as planned, the login process will eventually be integrated into the browser. Uh, and uh, they're also going to be using it for Mozilla Sync. Uh, do you think the Mozilla Persona will suffer from the same fate as OpenID did, where there's a chance, or I'm sorry, or is there a chance? That we will see the single sign-on system become widely accepted. For example, Ting.com already supports it. Keep up the great work. Right. Um, the fact that you can just use your existing Google address, and I'm guessing it just does as like a sub-call to the Google single sign-on system. I'm not sure. Uh, the fact that you don't have to register a new account for it to work seems like it will overcome some of the difficulty OpenID had. Mm. But really, just depends on how much adoption it gets out of, outside of Mozilla. Like. Yeah. Sure, Firefox will support it, but is Chrome going to support it? So if yes, then it's got a good chance of going forward. I uh, I was kind of um, I and was, then I think adoption will also be pushed if people start buying these Firefox phones. Yeah, I was going to say that. I w uh, I was a little bearish, and now I'm a little bullish on it. So in uh, episode sixty three of Coda Radio, we brought on a developer of Mozilla Persona, and uh, after talking with him for about a half hour or so. I became convinced it's actually a really good system, and you know they are looking at it from a very big picture, from Firefox OS to Sync and all that kind of stuff. And there is a really good story here for developers. There's a lot of good reasons for developers not to come up with their own authentication system, not to try to invent that aspect of their application, and instead, quote-unquote, outsource that, that authentication piece to Mozilla Persona. Plus, I trust the Mozilla Foundation, and I think that's one of the key differentiators between OpenID is you, it's... Uh, Persona is backed by that Mozilla Foundation, and I think that's a good sign, too. All right, who are you chatting with over there? I hear you over there. Oh, you're in that chat room again. See, if, Lots you, of them. if you guys were here live on this Thursday afternoon and over at jblive.tv, you, too, could be chatting with Alan during the show. <laughs> All right, Mad Max, Mad Max writes in. He says, uh, hi, I've just been re-watching every single TechSnap since the beginning with episode one, and it's a great show. Up to episode 103, you said multiple times you hate to let users update their Java because of toolbars. I know. Well, it's not that I hate to let them. It's just it's annoying that when you're updating, it tries to install a toolbar. Oh, that, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That is a pain in the butt. He says, like, I, wanna... I really don't want this crapware. Why? It's like Oracle should be beat mercilessly with a hammer for that. <laughs> so, Ninite or Ninite, I've actually used it. I've never had to say it. What is it? I don't know. Ninite. It automatically installs or updates software of your choosing, whether you, uh, you run it, it'll download the newest versions from the web, skipping the, all the adware that usually comes with it, and no user interaction is required. The standard installation is free, but still pops up if you wanted to auto start. You can, however, buy an updater which is completely silent, or buy the pro for business. This is used to update Windows applications. The software worked, I've worked on it with a small PC repair shop, 
and I install all the so software and hardware packages, software packages, using it to set up a new computer. Yeah, I've used this. I've used this program before too. Actually, and I completely had forgotten about it. There's a whole series of programs that were around for a long time that sort of streamlined the updating process of of Windows. And then every company tried to make their own. Like there's yeah. the Adobe update for all your Adobe apps, and the Qu Apple update for all your. It's like on my phone or on my uh, laptop because I have QuickTime installed as part of the Wirecast to do video compression. Yeah, it keeps trying to make me install iTunes when I don't want iTunes. Oh right, on my yeah, I hate that. Yeah, that's, that's crap. Uh, so and it's just like it's yeah, one of these things like where you end up with forty different updaters all the time. You know, the Logitech updater and the oh, the uh, Lenovo updater and the Apple updater and the Adobe updater, and it's like I just want it all to go away. This is pretty sweet. So there's like a crap ton of really, all, basically all of the best software that is available for Windows on one page. You check it, and then you download a single installer, and this single installer... Th is, is this app open source? I don't think it is, right? Uh, I don't know. No, because they have a pro version. You're right. And so it, it makes me wonder about, you know, how we can be, I'd be sure that the yeah. update for, for whatever app they're sending me it doesn't include malware. Um... It's you know, pretty well known, this, though. Yes, and that helps, but yeah. it's not quite the same as a guarantee. No, you're right. From you know, actually being able to compare, you know, it's Microsoft doesn't publish what the SSH two fifty six hash of the Skype update is, so it's not like you could compare it to something. But <laughs> you know, if if somebody built a, a tool that was designed with more security in mind, other than you know, there's a lot. It's important to have all your apps updated, and so that provides a lot of security, but you have to consider the channel of how you're getting the updates and make sure that nothing malicious is getting in that channel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I like that their pro version lets you like push uh, software packages to a lot of workstation machines. Assuming it's legit. And I've right, used like it if you're if you're in a big corporation then you can have you have like Windows S U S and you can Yeah. I think if you wrap if it See, comes with a MSI installer or you wrap it in one. Yeah, that's 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 anything. where that's where WSUS falls down is you have to have an MSI that works, whereas this will work with like a lot of off the wall stuff like FileZilla, where I've never right. gotten that to deploy. Uh, but anyways. Well, yeah, but you should be able to wrap that in an MSI somehow. But oh it, yeah, no, you can it of... it's just that it's it's that only some it, it's a little more picky when you're pushing it through WSUS. Uh, yeah. all right, Kyle writes in. Hi Chris and Alan, I have a free BSD server on my LAN with a handful of jails that provide internet facing services. I currently isolate the jails from the rest of my LAN using a natted subnet and PF rules on the FreeBSD box, and then I forbid a crosstalk between the subnets with exceptions for the router so that way they can get internet access. Kind of feels like a dirty solution. Is there any way to use VLANs to clean this up a bit? My FreeBSD machine only has a single NIC. Oh, we included a um, picture too. You could do VLANs, but it sounds like what you're doing is, is probably the easiest solution. Uh, yeah. Because... VLANs are helpful when you're, they're enforced by a switch and you're, making, you're basically dividing a switch into separate switches. But when it's all inside one machine like that, it's not necessarily any easier to do it with a VLAN. So I guess this would be sort of the advantage to doing virtual machines over jails in his case because he could have a virtual not network. Really. Well, you know, you're still getting the virtual network, though. But they could be each on their own individual virtual network, right? And then you could have a machine that's plugged well, into each one of them. He wants the, the jails to be able to talk to each other, right. from my understanding. So you could have, uh, yeah, so no. he, basically, he's using the firewall on the, one, the machine that hosts all of them to yeah. control everything, which is fine. A VLAN comes in handy once you have multiple servers, and you need to allow a certain amount of cross, uh, some traffic to cross between them and some traffic not. So if you didn't right. want them to talk at all, because he forbids all cross-talking between the subnets, but whatever's in the individual subnets can talk to each other. Right, well, that's how subnets work. That's what you want. But each machine has its own subnet, so it's kind of like, you know, it's going mean, to... Each jail has yeah, each jail. an IP in... Yeah, but they're not... Each jail doesn't have its own subnet in the uh, way he's doing it. He okay. just has one subnet gotcha. that's like his, his DMZ, right? His demilitarized zone. All the services jails go in this subnet, and that subnet can't talk to his regular LAN subnet, which is how you would normally set it up. And yes, normally you would do that with VLANs on a switch because each of those would be a separate machine plugged into the switch or whatever. Uh, when it's all inside one machine, it's a little easier to do it without the VLANs. But if you want to do VLANs, you can. They're fairly easy in FreeBSD. They're just virtual interfaces, and they all bind down to the one main interface. There you go. All righty. Good luck, Kyle. Uh, next question comes in from Jerome. He says, hi, Chris and Alan. On episode 125, a listener had a query about their private IP being exposed 
and it turned out that this was a proxy misconfiguration. Well, just for a point of interest, there's another way, apparently. The HTML WebRTC API can access this information, so it is really quite possible for a web page to peek at your privates, as it were. It's part of the standard, and he, he links us to the uh, enumhosts.html file that explains how WebRTC can look this up. I didn't yeah, know. WebRTC is fairly new, yeah. uh, but I think the, it's there for a couple of reasons, but I think it's supposed to be so that you can have multiple machines on the LAN be able to realize they're on the same LAN and talk to each other or something. Right, yeah, I'm sure it's but, that way they can... Like, I, I imagine there would be some privacy settings for WebRTC as well to control what can happen in and how much data you want to expose. I hope so. I hope but so. WebRTC is fairly new, so it's, yeah. I don't know that much about it. And there's going to be many implementations of it in different yeah. uh, setups. All right. Uh, so the next question comes from Michael, moving right along. He says, I know that Chris was a Google Reader user. What have you guys done now instead since Google Reader has been discontinued? He sent us one that he was looking at called Stringer. And I don't, Alan, I don't recall where you were more of a, not a really a big Reader user to begin with, right? I didn't, yeah, I... I Honestly, don't really use RSS feeds. I probably should for a bunch of stuff, but I don't. So I did an episode of the Linux Action Show called Reader Replacements in Season 27, Episode 7. I outlined a few different alternatives there. The one I ended up going with is Tiny Tiny RSS. I run it on my own local LAN. And uh, it is... a lot of people talking about that. It seems yeah, it's, it's pretty anagalous. Uh, anagalous? It's pretty equivalent Analogous. to Google Reader. Yeah. I, a lot of the same functionality. In fact, you can even, I think, import the OPML feed from Google Reader. And there's some good mobile apps that sync with your tiny, tiny RSS server. So you can read on the mobile device. And then when you get back to your desktop, all that same stuff is marked as red and vice versa. So tiny, tiny yeah. RSS was the one I went with. But Feedly is also probably the number two that I've seen on recommendations. Cool. And uh, Feedly looks like... I don't know if they still offer now that Google Reader's been shut down. They might, because Google has the whole data liberation thing, but like Feedly right. allowed you to like, you logged in with your Google account and then it would just suck all of it in and just completely set it up based on your Google yep. Reader config. So if that's still an option, that might be the fastest. I decided, you know, I looked at Feedly and I liked it, but I thought if Google couldn't make any money doing this, what makes me think that Feedly is going to be able to it's make gonna, any money? Yeah. And so maybe they're going to be gone or in gonna, years. Or they're going to start injecting ads into my yeah. feed. Or... That's almost a guarantee, you would think, right? So yeah. I just decided, screw it. I'll just set it up on my own. I'll use an open source project, and then I don't have to worry about being shut down on me in three years. Not a big deal for you, probably, but it's something to consider. Uh, so go look for uh, Season 27, Episode 7 of the Linux Action Show, where we outline uh, building your own Google Reader replacement. There's, and I include the hosted options, so it's not just all build your own either. All right, well, we got a lot more emails that came in while we started recording the show, but we're going to cover those in episode 130. Don't forget, you can contact us, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or hit that contact link at the top of our website and choose TechSnap from the drop-down. But with that all done, it means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. It's time for the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite fit at the top of the show. We still wanted to give you some links to check out on your own. And a lot of these links come from our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And, Alan, I'm pretty happy because I've successfully injected a little Star Trek into this episode of Tech Snap. And now I know our double recording session can be complete. And this one's kind of, especially for somebody like you who's, who's a world traveler these days, it's kind of bringing the Star Trek Universal Translator to real life. Uh, Microsoft well, Research... This one's one direction, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's the start. It's, it's early yep. days. Uh, this is a Microsoft research project, and here's a little live demo. Uh, you guys, you, you'll, you'll see, it's early days, but it's functional. Oh, I should say. So it's, it is a translator that takes what you say and translates it, but what's neat about it is it translates it in your own real voice. So this machine That's attempts... That's really interesting. It attempts to simulate your voice. And produce a text-to-speech system that takes Chinese text and converts it into Chinese language. And then we've taken an hour or so of my own voice, and we've used that to modulate the standard text-to-speech system so that it would sound like me. So what you see now is the result of that change. I'm speaking in English, and hopefully you'll hear me speak in Chinese in my own voice. Wait for it. Now, we, we can't quite hear it, but we'll be able to hear it here in a sec. Again, the results are not perfect, 
There are in fact quite a few errors. There's much work to be done in this area. It'd be interesting just to do text-to-speech in English in your own voice. Yeah, really. It, it might have been a, a better demo of the voice modulation. Very honestly. good point, because, yeah, there's differences there. Yeah, for sure. Right, like, you can still tell it's kind of mechanicalized, but it, does, it doesn't sound the same. It, it, it yeah. definitely has more of that, the tone of your own voice, and that'd be really interesting. It's pretty cool. I, and I can see, you know, then you could get profiles of different people so that you could... Oh, you, know, have, you could have your own celebrity voice. Yeah, so like it, when your computer talks or reads text to speech, you can make it read it in you know, some Sh voice where that you like. See, the song, where is the bathroom? Where is yes. the bathroom? <laughs> Sean Connery or the Leonard Nimoy or whatever different. I cannot find the bathroom. It is most illogical. All right, <laughs> next story in the roundup. Uh, the NSA brought exploits from Vupin, a contract shows. Yes. Um, was it Muckraker uh, did a Freedom of Information Act request and uh, got access to the, a declassified version of the contract where it shows the NSA subscribed to Vupen, which I think we talked about is $150,000 just to get access to the catalog. You don't actually get any exploits. Right. Just a list of what ones they're willing to sell you. Just to shop. Yep. Wow. Oh, by the way. Uh, and so if they subscribed, they most likely bought a bunch. So if it makes you feel better, uh, Vupin CEO says, uh, we only sell to democracies. We respect international regulations, of course, and we only sell to trusted countries and trusted democracies. They're like, yeah, we don't sell to oppressive countries. I'm like, well, which, what's your definition of uh, oppressive? <laughs> I'm feeling a little oppressed these days, Alan. I'm going to be honest with you. How uh, to help by being oppressed. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because, again, like all of these uh, FISA uh, releases, like totally all blacked out. Like it's just, yeah. It, yeah, it's barely released really, but it is what it is. Okay, well, here's a popular topic, building versus buying. Netflix. Oh, you, skipped a, you skipped a story. Oh, did I? Sorry about yeah. that. I, or maybe <laughs> uh, it's going to be coming up. You never know. Declassified uh, foreign intelligence surveillance court document shows that uh, none of the U.S. phone companies challenged directives to turn over bulk telephone records. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Although, after what we heard from the CEO of Yahoo saying that, they said, if you try to challenge this, we'll charge you with treason or something. Yeah. You might, you know, that doesn't mean they all wanted to hand over their records. <laughs> they might have just been too afraid of retaliation to try to fight back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I, anyway, we have the... Uh, the declassified document there uh, as a PDF that you can read through and it's, uh, I think make your it's, own decisions. Yeah, I think it's not too surprising. Because remember when Quest, uh, we had a great conversation about this actually last night on Filter, when Quest fought back, their, their, their boss ended up in jail. Uh, yeah. All right, now we're on to the building, right, Netflix? Yep. All right, so here we go. Building versus buying, how Netflix streams 114,000 years of video every single month. They're building their own customized server boxes, which you have talked about. And yes, it's just running really, FreeBSD. Yeah, it really kind of echoes out how a lot of the things you've covered over the years, over the year, uh, uh, how they're building out their content distribution network, building their own custom servers. And what I thought was of particular interest is later on when you drill down into uh, the meat and potatoes of it, Netflix is working real close with HGST uh, to help reduce the power and the uh, cooling costs for their football, or <laughs> for their hard drives, including filling the hard drives with helium. Right, instead of regular air, so there's less friction. Yeah. So the drives won't generate as much heat, and it also may allow uh, higher speeds with uh, less turbulence. Yeah, they're working with them directly to kind of try to get that all sorted well, out. Well, because, you know, originally Netflix used regular CDNs, uh, but the problem is those regular CDNs weren't optimized just for the specific use case of Netflix. Like, the way Netflix is set up is a little different than most of, like, scale engine video streaming customers or, you know, Level 3 is dealing with a lot of regular HTTP, and so their setup wasn't exactly optimized to deliver the video as fast as possible. So Netflix had to start building their own boxes. Yeah. And so they did this FreeBSD machine approach. But they're like, if somebody would make an appliance that did what we wanted, we would rather just buy that right. than build their own. <laughs> you know, they say they're up to 100 to 150 terabytes per box. Now. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they fit 30-some-odd hard drives in a box, and they have no redundancy. Right. Right? They just, each drive is a completely separate drive formatted with the FreeBSD UFS file system. And if a drive fails, then that 
machine just stores that much less video from now on. Makes sense, especially when it's all coming from a major, you know, one, one point. Uh, now, right, because well, the, the idea is that no machine is authoritative, right? So if your Netflix box or machine or whatever is trying to download this video and the hard drive in the machine you're pulling it from fails, the client in Netflix will just be like, that server's taking too long to send me the file or sent me an error. Right. And it just tries a different Netflix Who's next? server. Yeah. Yeah. And then so and then every day the Netflix servers decide this video is not getting watched anymore. I'm going to get rid of it and pick up this new video that is getting watched so that I'll always have the new content. Or, you know, they purposely push out uh, the con you know, when they when Netflix does its own shows, uh, the day before the show is going to air, they push it out to all their boxes so that they'll all be ready for it. Or sometimes they'll actually store multiple copies of the same show. Right? If a show or movie is going to be really popular, they store it on multiple hard drives so they can read from it quicker. Oh, right. right. And they also have uh, some boxes that are filled with just SSDs, so they don't hold as much, but they, they focus just on the really popular content. Whereas the hard drive based ones will focus on a wider array of content. They are what fascinates me about it is they are literally trying to solve and one of the one of the things that radio and T V has on internet distribution is that broadcast system where you can actually just broadcast through the air. And if you have a thousand people watching the broadcast versus one person watching the broadcast, it doesn't make a difference right. as far as your infrastructure. So goes. they're trying to push it all out to the end as much as possible and try to come up with a quote unquote broadcast solution for right. internet delivery. Well, you know, there's multicast, but that doesn't work on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so last week we talked about how Netflix has been bumping up against caps in Canada. And they yep. said it's almost a human rights violation. Well, and remember, you're, you made a, the very good point that these companies are not incentivized to reduce the caps because they sell TV. And they'd rather you watch TV than watch Netflix. Through them than through Netflix. Yeah. Exactly. Well, now Netflix's CEO has come out and said, hey, torrent privacy in Canada dropped 50% since Netflix launched. Maybe yeah, that will get them to uh, This was two. a talk about uh, in Europe. And yeah, they're trying to say, you know, movie companies you keep complaining about piracy. Well, if you would just sell them movies so we could put it on Netflix, then people wouldn't pirate it because they would just watch it on Netflix. And you know what? Guilty. If there's a movie I want to watch, and, you know, if it's, it depends on the situation and it's not on Netflix and there's not a reasonable way for me to get it, if I can download it, I'm going to be tempted to do that. And if it's on Netflix, you short-circuit that logic process immediately. As soon as I see it's on Netflix, that's a lot easier. saves me more time, so I'd rather do that. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Plus, i got Netflix on every damn TV in my house now. Can't get away from it. Uh, all right. Now we're going to talk about an open letter from a UK security researcher. Alan, I believe you tossed this one in the roundup. Yeah. Uh, so some security researchers in the UK have written an open letter asking the GCHQ, which is the... Uh, British version of the NSA, and the NSA to identify which crypto systems they purposely weakened so that they can be repaired or replaced. Not going to happen. <laughs> they, yeah. they don't want... The New York Times was going to say what systems, and they were asked to retract it from the article. Yep. So that's not going to happen, because yep. they need you still using those. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Yep. Uh, all right. That's cool. That's cool. Well, I got a bigger problem for you. Facebook. Bug on the Android, send all of your photos in the clear text. So if you're taking pictures of, pictures of your junk and sending them up to Facebook for some reason and expected privacy. Well, then you're kind of needed to be slept anyway. <laughs> you deserve what, what comes to you. Let's be honest. Stop using Facebook for pictures of your junk. Uh, but yeah, there was a bug in the Android app that uh, a researcher discovered and the Android app that enabled an attacker to view and download any images that a user sends to Facebook. The problem derives from the fact that the app, along with the official Facebook Messenger app for Android, don't send those images over HTTPS, even though the apps are meant to do so. There you go, Alan. He found it back in February, and he let Facebook know about it. Yep. Now, our, uh, our buddy Bruce... And, uh, it kind of seems to suggest that Facebook took since February to fix it. Exactly. Uh, Bruce writes... Uh, what, is, what is Bruce write? Tom, Tom Tomorrow? What is that, well, Alan? Uh, it's a comic. You can show it on the stream. It's just okay. a picture. I don't, uh, uh, it's a comic that came out in 1994 about the clipper chip, but if you just read the comic, it could apply just as much today. To I see. What we've been talking about. I see. I see. Very clever. Uh, see, it says, it's an election year, and politicians from coast to coast are busy giving crowd-pleasing speeches about the need to get in tough on crime. Our streets are full of criminals whose convictions have been overturned on the technicalities so we wouldn't elect one of them to Congress. 
kind of long, Alan. <laughs> yes. Anyway, uh, it goes on to show that, you know, uh, all of this hysteria over crime may help the FBI and NSA push through their plans to turn uh, the information highway into an Orwellian surveillance system capable of uh, monitoring any citizen's phone calls, emails, credit cards, and expenditures. Ah. To which the politician replies, just think of us as a caring, watchful relative, like a big brother. Right. Or maybe I should rephrase that. <laughs> right, and then it goes on, you know, uh, why stop there? Why not give law enforcement officials the power to search anyone's home at any time with no particular reason? And it goes on from there. But uh, the link's in the show notes if you want to read the whole comment. There you go. All right, last story in the roundup. Security company says the NASDAQ waited two weeks to, to fix a cross-site scripting flaw. The flaw could have been used to elicit personal details from the website's users. Well, that doesn't sound good, Alan. No. Uh, no, this is, this is just the NASDAQ site where you can create a profile and put in the stocks you own and, and track them. It's okay. not all that big of a deal. Gotcha. Uh, but, you know, when it's any financial information, they really should be more on top of things. Yeah, two weeks to fix the uh, cross. Well, who knows? Maybe their programmer was yeah, out but, on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> No excuse. Cross site scripting is 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 usually a fairly trivial fix. It's just a matter of of properly escaping the the user input in when you display it in the output. Right. So they should have fixed it pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. That's usually a very quick fix. Yeah. Well, all right, Alan. That brings us to the end of the roundup. If you would like to get some stories into the show, there's always a really good shot. You can get something in the roundup. Just submit it to links. TV. You can also start discussion threads over there, and we'll uh, bring those into the feedback section of the show. And you can also just comment and give people advice or share your insights on a particular story. If there's something that's been in the headlines, throw a link to it in our subreddit and then leave your comment about it in the show notes, or I mean uh, in the comment section, and then we might even put it in the show notes. It helps us kind of something to take into consider when we're putting the show together. So it's appreciated on that, on that level too. All right, Alan. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Don't forget, TechSnap will be live next Thursday over jblive.tv at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? Uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And we're also over at jblive.info for the audio version. You can grab RSS feeds of TechSnap. That way you get the show automatically every single week. And you can also help defer our bandwidth costs by utilizing the torrent downloads. We also have RSS feeds for that as well, and we appreciate that. Okay, Alan, well, I hope you have a great trip. I'm sure yes, by too. now you already have. And we'll be back for episode 130. That's cool. So we'll be kicking back off. And uh, we'll hear all about your trip. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>